have no further questions. We are reviewing testimony from the last couple of days in the so-called Cloud Nine murder trial out of Florida. This is a case, as you've been watching, which involves three different defendants. They each face second degree murder and attempted second degree murder charges. This case is going to the jury tomorrow. We're expecting closing arguments throughout the day tomorrow. We have a state closing argument. Each of the three defense attorneys get to make an argument and then a state's rebuttal. So we're going to hear basically five separate closing arguments in that case. Just today, the judge decided that uh, the state would get its request under Florida law, this is the way it goes, for a lesser included charge. So the jury will also be able to consider manslaughter and attempted manslaughter as to the various victims in that case. Andrew Maloney is, or Mahoney, excuse me, is Mahoney. here. I'm tripping over my words, is here to join us for a little bit of analysis. So uh, we're waiting for that case to go to the jury tomorrow. Uh, but we're also talking about this next case that's coming up here on Law and Crime. This is the Todd Kenhammer case. And I know you've been reviewing the criminal complaint there. Yeah. You've got a defendant who claims this pipe, 53 inches if I'm remembering my math on it, fell off of a truck wound up piercing his windshield, injuring his wife. She died of the injuries, but there's a lot more to the story. The medical examiner's report just does not match up. There are more injuries, evidence of strangulation. Um, the shards of glass just didn't land where they should have landed had she been sitting in the front seat of the vehicle. A passerby claims that the vehicle was off the road right before police found it, but at that point there wasn't a pipe through the windshield. So, well, how did the pipe wind up going through the windshield? If the passerby is correct, it wasn't because it fell off the truck, because it would have fallen off the truck, then pierced the windshield, and then he would have pulled over. So there's a, a lot of explaining to be done here in this case. What do you make of it? Well, it, it certainly sounds like it was a staged event by um, the decedent's husband, Mr. Kenda Hammer. Um, certainly, uh, the evidence of his knuckles being bruised and bloodied would show signs that he had engaged in some kind of fight, and in this case, probably the beating of his late wife. Um, she suffered other physical injuries that were easy for a medical examiner to ascertain, um, blows to the face, strangulation, um, I think injuries to the back of the head, as well as the forehead blow, which I don't think he fully th thought it through. I, I think when you try to concoct a story or a lie, uh, you sometimes miss um, some of the other salient features and facts that you're going to have to be confronted with to try to explain away. You just really just can't do that in this case. Well, it seems that he would have had to explain away an awful lot here. So yeah. you've sat on both sides of the aisle here, former federal prosecutor, currently in criminal defense. So one thing we were trying to bat back and forth here earlier, that is Rachel Stockman and myself, is where the defense might go in this case. Is this going to be a case that's going to be really hard for the defense to explain out of this? Are they hoping for an acquittal or are they hoping just merely to knock this first degree murder charge down a notch and say, well, uh, nothing was premeditated? Uh, do they try to say his uh, version of the story uh, involving the pipe falling off a truck was a lie and that there's some other story there that the police just aren't presenting? I mean, where does the defense I, go? You know, I, I, I'm curious because it doesn't seem like they have much to say or do. Even, even a reduced, uh, even if they're trying to get a reduced charge here, um, it seems to me that when you try to cover up the murder, you sort of uh, are throwing all your eggs in one basket, and that is him claiming it wasn't me, it was this pipe that fell off a truck. Once you've gone down that route, and that's your theory, your defense theory, it's very hard to adjust to something else, or it's very to something else, or it's very hard to try to convince uh, anybody that you should get a lesser included offense when you've uh, essentially done a premeditated, premeditated cover-up at least, if not pre premeditated murder. So he isn't going to get much sympathy from the jury or from the judge. I mean, it's a bad tactic, generally speaking, for a defense attorney to get up there and say, the defendant's original story is a lie. Yeah. Because at that point, nobody believes any version of the story. He's done. He's done. I mean, fr frankly, you can't change you can't change horses midstream, and, and he's already down this road where he's got to go with the pipe theory, but it just doesn't add up. Aside from the witness uh, that, that saw the car, uh, the forensic evidence, which is objective evidence, just does not support his version of events. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about, and I'm going to sort of swipe the criminal complaint sure. document back from you again. Uh, this is a thing that, having been a local reporter on the ground in Wisconsin for three years of my career, well before I went to law school, uh, is the length 
and detail in Wisconsin criminal complaints. And this is an issue that came up in the Making a Murderer film that many of you uh, know me from. Uh, this is another example of a lengthy Wisconsin criminal complaint. This is seven pages of detail long, okay? When a prosecutor puts that much information into the complaint, does it make it nearly impossible for the prosecutor to change horses midstream? Uh, yes, it's a tactical mistake on the part of the prosecutor, um, both in the complaint stage and even in an opening statement at the beginning of a trial. You don't want to promise too much, and you don't need to promise so much. You just need to promise or articulate in your complaint the allegations that would, th with some facts that support the elements of the crime, and that's it. Something, something a little bit more than bare bones is sufficient. Once you go beyond that, once you start storytelling, you run the risk that you, the guy might have done it, but you, you may not be able to prove every single thing you've got, every single detail in there. It's not necessary for you to prove that, but the defense lawyer will use that and spin that in front of the jury and say, hey, listen, they told you at a certain time this happened, at a certain time that happened, X, Y, Z, A, B, C, and then suddenly when the prosecutor can't prove some of those points, which might have otherwise been irrelevant or not material to prove the elements of the crime, then it gives the defense an opening to try to tell the jury they've made all these promises and they've fallen short on several of them. Well, we saw this backfire in the making a murderer case because there, again, we had a lengthy criminal complaint document. Some would argue, uh, myself <coughs> being among that group of some, that sometimes the reason prosecutors tell the story is because it gets leaked out to the press. Reporters read these things. Once you put it in the criminal complaint, the rules of professional conduct in many states allow you to then point and say, well, it's on the public record. You can go tell the entire version of the story to the press. Word gets out in the community that this is what the defendant did, and people snap a judgment before the guy even winds up getting a trial. Uh, that's basically what many people, myself included, think happened in the Stephen Avery case. That was more than 10 years ago up there. And, you know, again, here we have a lengthy document which lays the story out uh, in one version of it. If it doesn't all become true, it's you know, problem. does it, does it, well, it is, but it isn't. I mean, does it really harm the prosecutor in the back end if they just say, well, judge, we're going to withdraw a charge or something? On this case, it wouldn't lead to that because there is literally only one charge. It's still going to be a problem because the defense lawyer is going to say, I have the complaint or I have the indictment. I should be able to read parts of that to the jury. Um, and then, or I should at least be able to tell the jury midstream or, or at least at the beginning of the trial, they withdrew some of the allegations they made because they overreached. So it's still um, possible for the defendant to use that as a weapon against the prosecutor. It's a mistake. And, if I, and I can't speak to the motivation of these prosecutors or any other ones in terms of why they have a long detailed complaint, but if, but if one of their motivations was to get it out to the public and sort of try their case in the press, then it's unethical and it's, and it's overreaching. They shouldn't be doing that. I lecture frequently on that topic and you know the rules of professional conduct. They say you're not supposed to try the case in the press or in the public, but there's that exception in the American Bar Association model rules and in Wisconsin that says if it's on public record, you can talk about it. Well, guess who gets to write the public record? The prosecutor. Correct. And, Correct. And I've seen cases tried this way before. And, and again, I agree. I'm not s specifically accusing these prosecutors of doing it that way. But whenever I see these kinds of complaints come out, I wonder what's behind them. I, I think it's foolish, you know, number one, to even have somebody raise that specter of an unethical complaint or trying a case in the press. But more importantly, from a strategical standpoint, if the prosecutor wants to win the case, if he believes he has the evidence, in the case, why take the risk of overreaching or laying out details that you may not be able to prove at the end of the day and that might otherwise not have mattered to meet your, uh, to prove your elements of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt? Why, why, why take on more of a burden? Uh, well, exactly, and, and we've seen that backfire in other Wisconsin cases, as I mentioned. At the federal level, uh, when you were prosecuting cases there, uh, my supposition from what you're saying is bare bones, enough to indicate that there's evidence to back up each element of the charged offense, but not too much because it allows you to continue to build the case. Correct. Correct. And trials never go according to plan. There's always a hitch for both sides. They never, they're a roller coaster. And you never know. You have to expect the unexpected. And so if you're promising to prove and do certain things, you're in for a big surprise very often and you have to adjust. Why make it harder for yourself if you actually put them in writing? I, I just wouldn't do it. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can see the wisdom behind what you're saying. So uh, let's uh, put this case on hold. We are waiting for opening statements to begin, uh, hopefully any moment. The jury uh, was close to being seated around the lunch hour, or I should say we had 11 members seated. They had to go addition, uh, beyond the 12 uh, to have enough alternates uh, and also to give both sides enough for peremptory strikes because in Wisconsin, that's the way the procedure works out. You seat your jury, you seat your alternates, you, you get a pool of maybe 15, 16, and then you go further uh, to give each side a chance to uh, make this, the strikes just for any reason whatsoever, not strikes for cause. Uh, that is the strategy that I saw at play in most of the Wisconsin trials that I covered. So they may need to see 20, 22, 24, depending on the number of strikes each attorney will get. So that process is uh, hopefully entering its uh, later stages uh, as we go through the afternoon. Opening statements in that case scheduled for uh, at some point this afternoon. They're running a little bit behind schedule, but we will bring them to you as soon as we have that case live out of La Crosse, Wisconsin. In the meantime, let's dial back again in the Cloud 9 case and continue to review testimony there because we're going to have closing arguments in that case starting tomorrow. Let's listen to some of the testimony of Davinus Blunt. He's one of the victims in the case and also, of course, an eyewitness. Skip key. Good afternoon. Can you scoot up? You're going to speak in the microphone and speak out loud, okay? All uh, right. Okay. What's your name? Tell the jury your name. Um, Davin is blunt. And how do you spell that? It's D-A-V-I-N-I-S-T. Okay. And how are you employed, Mr. Blunt? Uh, Budweiser. Triangle Sales. Okay. What do you do for them? Uh, warehouse operator. Okay. Team lead assistant. And how long have you worked for that company? Uh, coming up on three years now. Okay. Are you married, sir? Not yet. <laughs> Are you engaged? Uh, pretty soon. Pretty soon? <laughs> Do you have any children? Yes, I got one daughter. How old is she? Two. Okay. Do you live in Ocala? Do you live in Marion County? Uh, yes, I do. How long have you lived in Marion County? Uh, all my life. Okay. I'm going to direct your attention, Mr. Blunt, to the late night, early morning, late night of September 12th into the early morning of September 13th of 2015. Did you go to Club Cloud 9 that night? Yes. Why did you go to Cloud 9 that night? Uh, hang out, I guess. Uh. Were you uh, seeing someone at the time? Uh, yes. Who were you seeing? At the time, my girlfriend, Chantel. Okay. Uh, yeah. And did you, who did you go to the club with? Oh, that's who I went with. I mean, that's... Okay. Is she the reason why you went there? Yeah. Okay. Did you have any individual particular interest of going there that night? No, not really. Just oh. went because she wanted to go. Prior to that night, had you been to that club before? Yes, I have. Okay. Approximately how many times? Just one. <laughs> okay. Just one other previous mm -hmm. time? Okay. Is that a yes? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> Do you know approximately what time you got there? Uh, it's around like 10, I think it was, maybe 10, 30, something like How that. How crowded was it when you got there? There wasn't nobody there when I first got okay. there. Okay. <laughs> nobody there. Um, what was the security like getting into the club that night? Well, there was a bunch of people standing around talking. <laughs> okay. Did you have to pass through security to enter into the club? Oh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, what did they do to check you to get into the club? Uh, just a uh, pat down and, you know, like, you know, the place. Okay. Um, did you have to show ID to get in? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. When you got inside, where did you go? Um, well, I went to the bar. I had a friend that uh, I known from a while ago. I was just sitting at the bar talking to him. Okay. Did you stay in that location? The entire time that you were in, inside? Oh, no. Okay. Where, after you you talked to your friend at the bar, where did you go inside the club? Uh, the little booth that was in the corner right there, and I was just sitting there the whole night. Okay. So after you went to the booth, that's where you stayed until you left the club. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Where was that booth in relation to the front door? Uh, it's right around the corner. You just step, like, so when you walk down and made a right, like, the door is right there. Okay. So you walked inside and made a right, or you walked inside and you made a left? Oh, I walked to the booth. 
Yes. Oh, well, to get to where I was, you got to walk in and go to the left. Okay. And that's, so you're more towards the front of the club? Yes. And that's where you stayed once you sat down there until you left? Yes? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what was your girlfriend at the time doing inside? Oh, uh, walking around and I guess associating with people that she know. Did you have a view of the entire club where you were sitting? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. Was it raised in any way? Oh, yes, it was. Okay. Did you see a fight break out inside while you were sitting up there in the booth? Mm -hmm. Faintly, but I don't really remember too okay. much. Okay. Okay. How did you, how could you tell that maybe something was going on inside the club? Mm, a bunch of people crowding around, loud yelling and stuff. They okay. knew something was going on. Could you tell? or see anybody that was involved in that? No? Uh, no. Is that enough? No. <laughs> okay. Did you see what happened to that group of people? Uh, no, not really. Just like a lot of commotion and moving around and like I said, people getting moved in different directions, but I, guess I really couldn't see too much of none. really wasn't paying attention. <laughs> okay. Just... What made you decide to leave you wanted to leave? Uh, just get out of there and just ready to get home. Just, just something ain't feel right. Just, okay. Just okay. trying to get out of there. Um, were they closing the club down t in your impression at that point in time? Uh, yes, they were yeah, getting ready to. Okay. How, what told you they were getting ready to close the place? Well, he kind of announced it on the, on the, uh, in the booth and kind of said something and all the lights come on and, but I was trying to get out of there before that and like, okay. You know, right, trying to get out the door, that's when everything, everybody trying to get out, so. Did you look for your girlfriend? Did you look for Chantel before you left? But yes. Before yes. you left? Did you find her inside? Yes, I did. Where was she? She was coming over, I think she was over by the bar doing something, talking. Okay. Did you walk out the front door together? Yes. Okay. What happened when you got outside the front door? Uh, walked out, and then... <laughs> like I said, remember walking out, taking a couple steps, and before I know it, just, just shots ringing off. Okay. So are you all the way out of the doorway in the front of the club when you hear shots? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. And where was Chantel? Uh, she was right beside me. What happened when you heard that? Uh, I kind of <laughs> split ways. She kind of, kind of pushed it back that way, and I took off for another direction. Okay. Where had you parked? Uh, I parked over by the, uh, the little billiard place, the, um, whatever it is, right across to the right of the club. Okay. Um, and so what direction? Did you go towards where you were parked or the other direction? I went the other direction. Okay. And Chantel went towards where you were parked? Uh, she went in the direction I kind of pushed it down. Okay. <laughs> what happened after you started running? Uh, I was running and kind of felt my leg kind of give out and, you know, couldn't run no more, so I just laid there. Okay. How far did you get? Uh, not too far. Okay. And what did you realize after you felt on the ground? Uh, something had happened. <laughs> you know, a bunch of people like, uh, like I say, hollering, screaming and stuff, and I'm you know, rolling over and looking at, you know, all this blood on my shorts, you know, and I was like, uh, something ain't right. <laughs> okay. Um, did you realize you were shot? Yeah, when I seen the blood, I knew something. <laughs> Where were you shot, Mr. Blunt? Uh, my left leg. Okay. What part of the leg? Uh, right above my knee. Okay. And when you fell, did you stay in that location? Uh, I did until um, I could really, I guess, adjust to see what was really going on. Did people come over um, and try to help you? Uh, not till I was able to stand and call somebody. Okay. But um, I don't, ain't nobody see me over there. I was way off by myself. Ain't nobody see me. Okay. Um, so you stood back up after you fell. How far did you get after after you stood back up? Uh, I managed to like walk over by uh, it was a truck parked like almost by the oyster bar counter, and I managed to like stand up like by the truck. And what happened once you got over near the truck? 
uh, I just called, <laughs> called 911. Okay, so you had you had a phone on you, yes, ma'am, and you called 911. Okay, did any police officers or medics or anything show up to help you out? Oh uh, yes. What showed up first, an officer or a medic? Uh, officer did first. What happened when an officer showed up? Uh, he showed up, and I'm uh, just talking to him. Well, actually, I gave him the phone so he can talk to the operator because I didn't know a lot of stuff she was saying in it. So I let him talk to her, and basically he walked me around the other side of his car. And he was kind of telling me to calm down and stuff. You know, basically that was it. Okay. Did you get transported to the hospital? Uh, yes, ma'am, I did. Okay. And once you got to the hospital, uh, did you have to have surgery or anything? No, ma'am, no surgery. How long were you in the hospital? I left early Sunday morning around about, uh, I'd say approximately between 6.30 and I think maybe 7 o'clock. So you were there about five or six hours? Yeah, ma'am. Okay. And do you have any lasting effects from being shot in your upper leg, upper left leg? Uh, I guess some. It hurts sometimes, time to time. Maybe some nerve damage. I mean, it's on the way I can, I guess. But you ever sometime. have to take anything for pain? No, ma'am. I don't have to take anything. Okay. No, ma'am. Did you see um, anybody with guns that night? As far as what you mean? Did you see anybody at the club with firearms that night? Like anybody, anybody. anybody. I remember seeing, uh, I think one security, uh, I think he had one on his hip. Okay, on his hip, you think? Did you see who shot you? No. Okay. <laughs> Were you running away when that happened? Yes, indeed. <laughs> Do you know somebody by the name of Benitria Robinson? Yes, I know. Did you see her at the club that night? Yes, ma'am. Did you see her when the shooting started? Yes, I saw her. She was standing maybe a little in front of me. Okay, so she was in front of you when the shots started? Yes. Okay. And did you see her fall? Yeah, I seen her going to the ground. Like I said, when I, I seen everybody start to separate. And I just remember seeing her falling and going to the ground. Like I said, I was taking off another direction. Mr. Blunt, do you know my client, Michael Smith? No, can't say that I do know him. Okay. Um, on September 13, 2015, did you see anyone that looked like him at the club? My client? No, not inside the building. Okay, thanks. Mr. Bankowitz? You know Gary King, the gentleman sitting here? No, I can't say that I do. And you remember seeing him at the club that night? No, I don't really remember seeing him. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Gorley? Yes, sir. Mr. Blunt, at the time that the shots were fired, do you remember hearing or seeing anything? Just people yelling. I remember noticing a vehicle on Pine traveling fast? I remember a lot of cars traveling fast, okay. to be honest do you recall if you told the detective that when he interviewed you? Yeah, I remember hearing the car speed off. Okay. I said a bunch of cars riding by, people just cars scrambling everywhere. All right. Was that at the time of the shooting? Sure, and after. Okay. During the time of the shooting, do you remember telling the detective about a car speeding? Why? During the time of the shooting? At about the same time. Faintly, I don't really yeah, I don't recall. Okay, thank you. We are continuing to review testimony in the so called Cloud Nine trial out of Florida. That's where three defendants are facing second degree and attempted second degree murder charges with relation to the death of one <coughs> young woman and injuries to several other people at a nightclub. So, uh, this is a case, Andrew, where we've got some witnesses changing their story on the witness stand. One guy 
is scheduled to testify. He doesn't even admit his own name in front of the judge and says, no, that's, and, and basically ultimately says, I'm not going to take the oath to tell the truth. The judge holds him in contempt, so he's out. He was a critical witness for the state. Then you've got another witness who was initially in the police reports only pointing the finger at one of the defendants, and then he eventually on the stand points the finger at all three. When he was cross-examined by the defense, as to why he changed his story to suddenly implicate all three, his response back was, I'll never forget the faces of people who try to kill me. Does the jury look at that and say, that's a strong response, or do they look at it and say it's covering for something? Well, it could be either one, but um, there's been plenty of cases where cooperating witnesses have had a change of heart uh, for one reason or the other. They feel threatened or they don't want to testify against a, a childhood friend. Um, but some of those um, codes, Omerta, the mafia used to use that, that as the code of silence, they sometimes can change quickly when you're facing a long prison sentence or when you're threatened by a rival, uh, not a rival gang member, but one of your friends that was purported to be a childhood friend. They've threatened you, your life or the, that of your loved ones. Then they decide, okay, I no longer have to honor my code of silence. Um, he's threatened me or he's threatened my friends and family. I now feel at liberty to go ahead and testify against them and help them be convicted. So it could be either one. Um, the key, anytime you put a, cor a corroborating witness on, or a, a, a witness who's cooperating, is corroboration. You need to get corroboration because it's very difficult sometimes for a juror to determine whether or not this bad guy, an admitted bad guy on the stand, is telling the truth. Well. I, I don't know if this is what's going to happen here, but it makes me wonder if it's the sort of case where we're going to get a split verdict. Because there are a lot of people on the stand who saw one of the defendants, that's defendant Barrow, <coughs> with a gun. And we had witness after witness after witness saying, that guy fired shots, or I saw him with a gun, fired shots in the crowd. There's different versions of it, because of course the witnesses are in different places, sure. they're seeing different things at different times. One saw him with a gun, and then ran and took cover, and then heard shots. Well, you, you can put two and two together along with the other witnesses and say, okay, it's more likely than not, or I guess I should say, beyond a reasonable doubt, I would be convinced that he pulled the trigger. Some of these other defendants, though, there are only one or two witnesses that can put them at the scene with a gun. One of them uh, is pretty strong, though, says, well, I saw them go over to a vehicle, retrieve guns, and come back to the scene. But there aren't as many eyewitnesses for the other two defendants. Part of me wonders if the jury might look at that and say, okay, we'll go for a top charge with the guy everybody saw and then a lesser included for the others or some other version of a verdict here. A and then in one half of my brain, I think that that might happen. And then the other half of my brain says, well, wait a minute, you've got the corroborating forensic evidence. You've got bullets fired from three different guns. One gun fired 13 bullets. The other two guns fired four bullets each. So it's clear that you've got one, uh, primary shooter and then a couple of secondary shooters. And then I just look at that and say, the jury's going to look and say, okay, those are the three guys. Let's, let's ship them off on the top charge, each one of them. It could happen. That's what makes uh, jury trials so unpredictable, frankly. Um, I think with Barrow, there was some additional evidence. Uh, I think forensics found gunpowder in his mm -hmm. hand. Uh, there were statements pre-shooting that the bouncer overheard that are pretty compelling. So I, I agree with you that the case against him is far stronger than the others, uh, more eyewitnesses. Uh, but it is true, there's nobody that's denying that there were multiple shooters and there were multiple different shell casings found. So there's, there's certainly no doubt that there were multiple shooters. So the question is, who were those other shooters? How strong is the case against them? The jury will certainly believe there were multiple shooters, but unless they can link the other, the other three uh, or two with Barrow in terms of being his, his uh, members of his uh, inner circle or gang or whatever, um, or additional evidence besides the eyewitness testimony, it may be a tough case against the other ones. I don't know that the jurors will, if, you, if you're a good defense lawyer, you're going to make an argument, it was a terrible tragedy, my guy wasn't even there, or he was there but he was nowhere near the, the shooting, and uh, if you only have one or two eyewitnesses that saw him there uh, or didn't see him with a gun, it's that's, that's enough maybe for some jurors to say 
there's reasonable doubt there that he may not have been one of the additional shooters. Yeah, this could have a couple of possible outcomes. And, you know, people always ask me, well, what do you think is going to happen? Of course, I don't know any better than you or anyone else does what's going on in the minds of the jurors. I could look at the evidence and say, well, it's a really strong case against Laquan Barrow. It's a weaker case against the other two. But I keep going back to that forensic evidence that there were three guns there, which would back up the minor uh, witnesses who saw uh, that did indeed point the finger at those other two guys and say, OK, look, you know, the bullets didn't just all fly out mm. of one gun. And uh, to me, that's enough to put it together. I, I would be inclined to convict on the top charge if I were on the jury. But I, yeah, I'd have to know. hear all the testimony on the other two uh, potential shooters. It's very difficult for us sitting here to try to characterize how strong that eyewitness testimony was because, as you know, Aaron, eyewitness testimony is, is considered to be somewhat unreliable, in fact, highly reliable in cer depending on the circumstances. So uh, I would have to hear, I think you would have to hear how compelling and how strong each of those eyewitness testimony uh, was in, in the courtroom and if there's anything else to corroborate it beyond their eyewitness testimony from the night of the incident. Yeah, we'll have to wait and see how the jury is going to ferret out the various facts here. And I'm wondering how the state's going to wrap this all up on closings tomorrow, because it would seem to me that one thing the state can lean back on is what I was just discussing is the forensic evidence from the bullets. They can keep going back at that and saying there were three gunmen, and we know it because of the objective evidence the ballistics says there were three different guns used. I don't think the defense team will deny that, and they shouldn't. Um, just concede the obvious. The things that they have to concede, they can concede. That doesn't convict the other two shooters. Um, if all you have is eyewitness testimony from one or two and it was dark and it was chaotic, that might not be enough to convince a jury. So uh, I'd like to know a little bit more about what else they have or how strong that eyewitness testimony was on the other two shooters. I think you're right. There's no question there were three shooters. So the only question is who were the other two, what's the identity of the other two shooters? You know, uh, this leads to questions about the defense strategy here. The, the defendants are putting up these various friends and acquaintances basically saying, oh, yeah, I saw him at the scene, but he didn't shoot anybody. It directly conflicts with the state witnesses. Do you think it's possible, because I think it is, that the defense strategy of doing that did more harm than good? Because when you get all of your own buddies, your associates, your relatives up there to, to basically say, oh, yeah, he didn't do anything. He, he wasn't involved in any of this. And it directly conflicts with the state's version of things. The jury might look and say, OK, you've got witnesses sitting here testifying for the state um, in a situation that's volatile. They may be facing threats. They, they may fear retaliation. So we'll credit the state's witnesses with a plus. And these relatives are just lying to cover for their, their buddies and their uh, their relatives who are sitting in the defendant's chairs. Uh, and the jury might look at it and say, defense, that's all you've got? We don't believe that. Well, you know, <laughs> some a witness testifying on your behalf is better than no witnesses, I think, usually. Um, it is true that every time a witness takes a stand, you have to determine, as a juror, um, do I believe this person? Where is their, where, do they have some kind of bias? And clearly, if it's a friend or a relative of the defendant, there's a built-in bias, and that's going to have to be dealt with, and that's going to be have to be addressed by the defense lawyer. Um, there are some witnesses like that, a family member or a friend, that are nonetheless compelling and sympathetic and believable, and others that are not. Uh, but clearly, and they'll, they'll get an instruction from the judge before they start the deliberations to consider bias uh, of, of any witness. That may also include a cooperating witness. It might even include a police officer with a certain bias. So it's hard to have uh, a completely um, clean witness, a, a nun, if you will, taking the stand that doesn't potentially have some kind of bias. That alone is not enough to say that they're not telling the truth, but it's something to consider. You know, at one point we even heard a tactic or a theory sort of try to sprout wings and fly out of the fence that maybe the bouncer was the first one that fired the bullets in this case. I mean, there's no evidence of that. That just deflates the defense's credibility. Uh, it didn't go very far at trial, but it was floating out there for a little while. And it's another one of those things that I don't think anybody bought that either. And the fact that it was just even there sounds like there's no credibility behind it. Well, it's true. When you uh, use a shotgun approach, uh, not to be um, 
you know, to have a pun in a shooting case, but if you use an approach where let me try multiple theories and see which one sticks with the jury, that can backfire because the really weak ones will discredit your own credibility as a, as, a, as a lawyer if you're putting that out there or the witness that's putting something like that out there. Because if it's easy to discredit, then you start to lose not just a little bit of credibility on that particular theory, but you may lose all credibility with the jury. It's a risky move. Let's continue our review of testimony in the so-called Cloud Nine murder trial out of Florida. Again, three defendants facing second degree murder charges with relation to the death of a 19 year old and a series of attempted second degree murder charges with relation to a number of victims who were injured in this shooting outside of a nightclub uh, there in Florida. Uh, let's continue reviewing testimony from one of the other uh, victim witnesses who uh, were among the survivors. Can you introduce yourself to the jury and spell your name for our court reporter? My name is Tamaya Watley, Tamaya T-H-O-M-I-A, Watley, W-A-D-L-E-Y. You live here in Ocala, Ms. Watley? Yes, sir. Have you lived here all your life? No, sir. How long have you lived here for? Say about 15 years. I know I'm not supposed to ask, but how old are you? 23. So most of your life you've lived here. Would you say you grew up here? You can say that. I want to ask you about something that happened on September 13th of 2015. Okay. Did you go to the Cloud Nine nightclub that night? Yes, sir. Who'd you go to Cloud Nine with? Audrey Bell. And why'd you go that night? My friend wanted to go, just went with her. And what were you all going there to do? Just have a good time. What would having a good time consist of? Drinking a little bit, partying, hanging, talking with friends. When you go out and about, like the Cloud Nine at night, do you see people that you know? Yes, sir. You know a lot of people? Yes, sir. Do you use Facebook? Yes, sir. Are there people that you're familiar with through Facebook? Yes, sir. Are, are they people you could be familiar with through Facebook who you then will see in yes, the nightclub? Sir. Are you familiar with anybody named Laquan Barrow? I'm familiar with the name. Did, have you, are you familiar with him through Facebook? Yes, sir. What name does he go by on Facebook? Sosa. Um, does he use the name Laquan or Quan in that name? Mm, I don't remember. Do you see that gentleman here in the courtroom today? Mm, yes, sir. Can you describe what he's wearing to the jury? A black shirt and a gray blackest tie. Any the record reflections identified Laquan Barrow? Record will so reflect. Are you familiar with somebody named Gary King? I'm familiar with the name. Can you put a face with the name? Yes, sir. Do you see the face here in court today? Yes, sir. Can you describe what he's wearing? Blue shirt. Do you know if him and Mr. Barrow are related? No, sir. Are you familiar with somebody named Michael Smith? Yes, sir, the name. Can you put a face with the name? Yes, sir. Do you see that face in court today? Yes, sir. Can you describe him for the jury? Uh, burgundy shirt. Do the record reflections identify Michael Smith? The record will so reflect. <clears throat> Did you see any of those gentlemen on September 13, 2015 at Cloud Nine? Yes, sir. Who? Uh, Quan. Where did you see Quan? Inside the club. Do you know somebody named Nathaniel Kendrick? Yes, sir. Kind of in the same way you know Mr. Barrow, Mr. Smith, and Mr. King? Yes, sir. Do um, you know somebody named Danielle Kendrick? Yes, sir. In the same way? Yes, sir. Did you know a young lady named Benitria Robinson? Yes, sir. Did you know Benitria a little better? Yes, sir. When did you first meet her? Um, it was a while ago. We played ball together, so. What kind of ball? Basketball. About how old were you when you met her? I want to say 16, somewhere like that. Was she your age? Um, she was, say, a year or two younger than me. And then what was the context you first met her in? On the basketball court. And do you remember who you were playing for then or what kind of game it was? I was playing for Westport High School. It was like a rival game. Who'd she play for? Forest High School. 
How many times in a season do Westport and Forest girls basketball, how often do you all play? Play like three times in one season because they were like a rival team, so we played them a lot. Other than playing basketball against Petitria in high school games, did you play anywhere else? Yes, we played at a um, recreation park called the Auditorium. Is that here in Ocala? Yes, sir. The War Memorial Auditorium? I'm sorry? The War Memorial Auditorium? I just called it the All. I'm not sure what's up. Fair enough. Um, did you, apart from playing basketball with Benitri, did you know her socially? Yes, a little bit. And why was that? Um, one of my ex-friends was really close with her, so that made me kind of close to her, too. Um, as of September 13, 2015, do you know what was going on in Benitria's life? Yes, sir. What was that? Um, she was in college playing basketball, and she also received a scholarship for softball. Was she good? Yes, yeah, she was very good. But she was in town that weekend. Yes, sir. Did you see her at the Cloud Nine nightclub? Yes, sir. Did you talk to her? Yes, sir. What was she doing that night? She was just standing, looking around. She was one of the first persons I seen when I walked inside. Did you go up and talk to her? Yes, sir. Ms. Wadley, while you were in the nightclub, did you see any type of fight or altercation occur? Yes, sir. Between who? Um, Danielle and Maisha. Who's Maisha? She's Kwan's sister. You know Maisha? Not like that, no, I don't. Kind of like you know Kwan? Yes, sir. Kind of like you know Gary? Yes, sir. Kind of like you know Jean? Yes, sir. How close was, was the altercation to you, Ms. Wadley? It was pretty close. It was like right in front of me. Oh, did you at all? I'm not sure if they did, but someone did. I'm not sure who. Did you see anybody else get involved in the altercation? Yes, sir. Who? Quan. What Quan did? He was pushing people around. Anybody else? No, sir. Did the altercation get broken up? Yes, sir. How did it get broken up? Um, I'm not sure if there were security guards or just random people, but random people were just breaking it up, trying to stop the fight. What happened after that? They got kicked out of the club, and the club just started back up. Did you go outside? After the club ended, yes, sir. Uh, how much later was that? I really can't remember. It wasn't too late after. When you went outside, were you with anybody? Yes, sir. Who were you with? Audrey Bell. What happened when you and Audrey walked outside? Um, we kind of stopped, like, not too far from in front of the door. She pulled out her phone. We heard yelling. As soon as I looked down at her phone, we heard shots, and we started to run. What direction did you run, Ms. Wampin? Coming out the club, I ran to my left. Can you tell where the gunfire was coming from? It sounded like it was coming from my right side, but I'm not sure exactly where it was coming from. When I fell to the ground. Where were you shot? In my leg. What part of your leg? I got shot in the ankle and it came out the other side of my calf muscle. Did you see who was shooting that night? No, sir. Did you go to the hospital? Yes, sir. The injury you received, does it still affect you today? Yes, sir. How the jury how? I get charged with horses almost every morning. Um, I can't sit for long. I can't stand for long. Do you play basketball? Not like I used to. Do you know if Quan, Gary, and Mr. Smith associate with one another? I don't know. 
I do have some questions. Ms. Wadley, um, when you went to the club that night uh, and you walked outside, did you see Michael Smith outside? No, sir. I mean, no, ma'am. I'm sorry. Okay. Did you see um, anybody with guns? No, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Ms. Wadley, you indicated that you know Mr. King from <coughs> Facebook, is that right? Yes, sir. And did you see him at the club that night? No, sir. Not at all? Anywhere, anytime? No, sir. Thank you. Mr. Gorley. Do you know um, Nick Smith? By Facebook. You I don't know. Has a nickname? Not that I know of. About, um, Danielle Kendrick. Does she have a nickname? Didi. Now, you indicated um, Maisha and Didi were involved in an altercation at the bar close to you, correct? Yes, sir. Did you see Nate Kendrick become involved in that altercation in any way, trying to separate people or, or anything else? No, sir. And I heard your testimony that Quan was pushing people around. Was that trying to break up the fight? I'm not sure what he was trying to do. I'm not sure what he was trying to do. As a result of that, did the bouncers come over and separate people? I've seen people breaking it up, but I'm not sure if they were a bouncer, security. I'm not sure. The bouncers at Cloud Nine wear what color shirts? I'm not sure. Did you ever see a bouncer that evening with a, um, a firearm? No, sir. Thank you. Anything else? Is the witness excused? That was testimony from Tomia Wadley, one of the surviving victims in this case. Many of the surviving victims testifying, Andrew, um, and we also had all the eyewitnesses testifying. It's interesting sitting down and trying to line up who they saw, when they saw it, and what they saw happen. And my guess is that that's exactly what the state is doing right now, preparing for closing arguments. They're going to have to line all this up and say, this witness pointed the finger at this defendant, but not these two. But then this one pointed the finger at those two, but not this one. And just say, when you add it all up, these three were involved. Yeah, they'll probably have to have some demonstrative aid, a flow chart, if you will, to show to the jury um, all the evidence against uh, a particular uh, defendant and then all the evidence against the, another one and, and, the, and the evidence against the other one. And as you pointed out earlier, Aaron, um, in a chaotic scene like that with, peop with witnesses um, positioned in different areas of the club, um, had different viewpoints and saw different things and couldn't see other things. So you're going to get um, a variation in eyewitness testimony uh, most of the time, and it's particularly in a case where you have a, a nightclub shooting or in parking lot. So it's, that's not, um, that in itself is not a problem, but it's a challenge. It's a challenge for the prosecutor to straighten it all out for the jury so that they can actually see when he, summarize, he or she summarizes the evidence through a, a flow chart, if you will, some demonstrative pictorial that shows who said what about whom. I started to do it the other day and uh, trying to line up who saw what do uh, what and when uh, turned into a bit of a challenge. We've got Danielle Kendrick saw Laquan Barrow uh, shoot her brother and then herself. So she's like, I got struck, my brother got struck, and this is the guy who did it. You've got witness Melissa Hall saying Barrow fired the gun. So we've got uh, two people pointing the finger at defendant Laquan Barrow. But then that uh, second witness I mentioned also saw Smith at the club, just didn't see him fire. So at least you place him there. Okay. Then you've got Ebony Yeomans saying Smith handed Barrow the gun, and then both of them fired shots. So then you've got Smith goes from being there to then being involved with handling a weapon to then firing shots. And then you've got Nathaniel Kendrick, who was the most seriously wounded, saying Smith, King, and Barrow all fired shots. But he didn't tell police that initially. One of the reasons he said he didn't identify all three of them during the police interview initially is because he was in a coma for more than a month related to the surgery. He was shot in the chest. He was very se severely wounded in this. Uh, it's questionable whether or not he'll be able to return to work. 
My guess, and tell me if you think I'm wrong, is that the jury might look at that and say, you know, that makes sense. This is why he didn't point the finger at all three of them at once. Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, if he was incapacitated both physically and maybe mentally, um, that's certainly an explanation, a plausible explanation of why he was remembering things in bits and pieces as he continued to convalesce. So there's nothing, uh, I, I certainly think that that still, that testimony can be credited by the jury. Um, I don't know what other evidence the prosecutors have in, in this case. Uh, I would hope that they would have looked at cell phones, for example, for text messages or uh, maybe GPS coordinates to find out if they were there at that location on the night of the shooting to eliminate the possibility that, any, that uh, if any of these defendants have tried to claim that they weren't even present at the location, uh, a cell phone might actually um, uh, rebut that kind of theory by the defendant. I assume none of these guys testified, but uh, there are other ways to prove that they were at that location besides the eyewitness testimony. And I just, you know, I, I just know from experience that eyewitness testimony is often unreliable. Maybe, may, not, I don't necessarily mean that they're lying, but they sometimes uh, have a perception of something that occurred in a split second and it makes it difficult for them to essentially be relied upon by a jury if you're going to convict somebody of reasonable doubt. Now, it varies. So some eyewitness testimony may be stronger than others. They, they may, in fact, know not only have recognized the guy, but know who he was, knew who he was before the shooting. We will have to wait and see what happens during closing arguments tomorrow. In the meantime, Andrew Maloney, I know you need to get back to work, so we'll let you go. We really appreciate you joining us with both the prosecutor and a little bit of the defense perspective. Yeah, absolutely. It was a pleasure to be here.